Hello, my name is Stéphane Vancel, and I'm the CEO of Moderna. It is a pleasure to welcome you to this Meridian Summit discussion on public and private sector action on equity, justice, and human rights. Moderna is a member of Meridian's Corporate Council and shares Meridian's vision that we are stronger at home when we engage globally. Global equity, specifically vaccines equity, has been a top priority for Moderna over the past 12 months as we began to scale production of our COVID-19 vaccine, SpikeVax. When the pandemic stuck, Moderna was a small R&D focused company that had yet to commercialize a single product. But we believed our mRNA technology could make a difference. And in a very short time, we were able to advance our technology from a scientific possibility to authorize product and commercial production and unprecedented speed and scale. From the beginning, our goal has been to help protect as many people as possible around the globe. To date, more than 250 million people have been vaccinated globally with the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine, and most probably some of you. However, we recognize that access to vaccines continue to be a challenge in many parts of the world. So we remain focused as a company on implementing a comprehensive and always evolving strategy to ensure that low-income countries get access to our vaccine. We will not stop working hard seven days a week until we get there. Our strategy has five pillars. First, to support global access of vaccines. In October 2020, we announced that we would not enforce our COVID-19 related patents during the pandemic so that other companies to develop an mRNA vaccine without having to worry about the question will Moderna will be giving them any trouble. Second, we committed to support the COVAX facility for low-income countries, announcing in May of 2021 that we will supply 500 million doses of our COVID-19 vaccine from the fourth quarter of this year on to 2022. Third, we have worked very closely with the US government to allow more than 50 million doses of our vaccine to be distributed to COVAX year to date. Fourth, earlier this month, we announced our plan to build a state-of-the-art mRNA factory in Africa with the goal of producing up to 500 million doses per year of vaccines on the continent. Fifth, we are currently investing to expand our capacity in the US and in Europe to deliver another 1 billion doses to low-income countries in 2022. And we target to be between 2 to 3 billion doses as a company for 2022, most of it for low-income country. Because as you know, there are less than a billion people in OECD countries. So these investments were done only to provide those to low-income country. We believe our strategy is comprehensive, but if more is needed, and we're unable to deliver more without undermining our current commitments, we will continue to add pillars to our strategy until this pandemic is over for everyone around the world. Again, thank you for your support. Thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to having a great session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bansell. Uh, that was great to hear from you, especially at this point in time. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja. Thank you so much uh, for letting me be here today. I will be your moderator today. I'm really pleased to be joining this session and joining this hour, which I know will be an insightful hour um, and really important for the 10th Annual Meridian Global Leadership Summit, Taking a Stand, Emergence of Public and Private Sector Action on Equity, Justice, and Human Rights. It's, of course, become a topic that many uh, average people and also corporations and investors have become very invested in over the past year during the pandemic and also uh, the economic crisis. But it's work that uh, the next few people that we'll, we'll hear from in this hour have, have really been trying to push forward for a long time. So uh, before we dive into the panel that we're going to hear, I'd like to extend a special welcome to Ambassador Patrick Gaspard for a brief discussion. Ambassador Gaspard is the President and Chief Executive Officer at 
at the Center for American Progress. And he is also the former US uh, ambassador to South Africa during the years of 2013 to 2016. Ambassador Gaspard, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm great, Jennifer. It's an honor to join you at this virtual fireside for this important conversation. Definitely. I, I'm, I'm so excited to talk to you, especially because of your experience uh, in the public sector. Let's just talk about sort of what we have seen over the past few months with the Biden administration. For the first time ever, we saw President Biden and the State Department um, bring in a, a chief diversity and inclusion officer for the first time in this country's history. When we think about progress on, on equity and inclusion, what... Where does this rank? I mean, is, is this a sign of progress to you? Absolutely. It's a critical uh, appointment, uh, one that uh, had been agitated uh, for, uh, for some time uh, by uh, activists outside of the department and uh, by stakeholders uh, within the department who appreciate that we've actually moved backwards uh, and not forwards uh, on diversity. For instance, right now, Jennifer, 90% of the senior foreign service in the U.S. is white. Uh, full 69, 70% of them are male. Uh, we contrast that uh, to 2008 when 9% uh, of the senior foreign service uh, was African-American. Today, that number is at 3%. So we've moved decidedly backwards uh, at a time when we've had greater diversity at, uh, the, at executive leadership levels and, and greater diversity in who's entered the department that's not been reflected in how leadership has been promoted, created, who gets agency and voice. So the appointment of the diversity officer is critical. But I'm going to say, Jennifer, that we need a little bit more uh, than that. Uh, that is a, that's, that's great, but we can't allow it to be symbolic. Uh, we need some real uh, action, not just because of those numbers, but because of things that we're seeing in policy outcomes. Yeah, you know, uh, Jennifer, that uh, I served in the State Department. I'm Haitian American. Uh, we've had some challenges uh, of late uh, in our policies uh, in that space, in Latin America, the Caribbean uh, in general, at our own borders. Uh, and I would posit that having more diversity of experience uh, in our ranks, particularly uh, experiences of color, uh, can lead to more democratic outcomes that center human rights uh, and democracy uh, and economic advancement uh, globally uh, in ways that can be transformative. So progress yet, yes. There's a journey yet uh, in front of us. What is the next step then? Then I mean, you mentioned a lot of uh, the the issues that uh, the government and the State Department is currently facing. I mean, uh, how how do you start to to progress? You know, especially you brought up um, your Haitian. You think about what's happened at the border. I mean, where do yeah. you start with some of the issues that the State Department is tackling uh, in order to to progress in the way that you're saying? Yes, Jennifer, I was um, uh, humbled to be able to join civil rights leaders uh, to go directly to the border uh, of, Del, of Del Rio to engage with those asylum seekers and to ask really important questions of our foreign policy leadership and our Department of Homeland uh, Security leadership. I want to take a step back, uh, if, I, if I could, uh, Jennifer, and just uh, ask us all uh, to recognize uh, that when we talk about the role that the U.S. has to play in the world on the work uh, of rights, it's not because we have this Pollyannish sense uh, that we've completed our journey here uh, in the US. Uh, when I was uh, privileged to be the US ambassador to South Africa, I was often asked, not just by South Africans, but by Sub-Saharan Africans in general, uh, how it was possible for me and others uh, from the US government to talk about issues of uh, maladministration, rights violations, the harassment that journalists were facing when they looked to the US and saw the circumstances that far too many uh, people of color, particularly Black Americans, uh, were living through it at, at a time when the nascent Black Lives Matter movement was taking hold uh, in this country. And I'd often say uh, that uh, the reason we uh, were forthright in having this conversation wasn't because we had completed our journey as Americans, but because uh, we were trying to hold even ourselves accountable to the creation of that more perfect union. I'd go so far as to say that the struggles, the challenges, uh, the journey that we've been on in the U.S. doesn't make us weaker in the global uh, community on these issues. It actually strengthens our hand. Uh, it should be part of our uh, narrative of inclusion uh, and equity. You know, Jennifer, right now in the U.S. State Department, there is an entire office that's dedicated to mainstreaming women's issues uh, in uh, our foreign policy. That is a right and appropriate thing. There's a, a special uh, envoy who's dedicated with a staff 
to LGBTQI issues. That's right and important. However, there's no policy leader uh, who has the portfolio to center racial equity uh, in, in uh, our foreign policy work. And I think that's missing uh, really an important part of the uh, equation here that I hope will change. Well, and um, how does that how does that work then? I mean, on the global stage, because we're also talking at a time uh, just a few days. President Biden is is going to be meeting with global leaders to talk about a, a lot of these issues that uh, we're discussing today. How do you how does he get through to the rest of the world that you know this is something that the country is working on, especially when you think about. Um, but sometimes what's happening on, on Capitol Hill and the infighting that's happening, it, it makes a lot of people discouraged sometimes on the global stage. It can, but we should draw on the, the, um, the powerful uh, example of experience that we've had where we haven't always done it right. Uh, but as a result of the engagement with civil society, with in, engagement with diverse leadership in our ranks, we've changed. I'll give you the example of um, the drone strike policy. Uh, I served in the Obama administration in, in his White House as political director in the first term and the ambassador in the second term. Uh, and I'm convinced that if not for external agitation, mostly uh, from uh, leadership of color uh, and some internal dissent, we would never have arrived at a proper interrogation of the drone policy uh, that is being promulgated by uh, the administration and that's now under current review uh, by, by the administration. That matters, particularly uh, when we are, as a nation, engaged in conflict uh, in spaces uh, that um, determine um, the future of black and brown bodies, to be frank. I think that there's a, a difference uh, in how the world approaches those spaces uh, than it does in even majority white spaces that are in conflict. And it's important to be candid about that, to say it directly. I'd also say that as President Biden um, uh, enters a discussion in Rome uh, in, uh, in a week from now, and then eventually at the end of the year when the U.S. is hosting the Democracy Summit, uh, it's really important, for instance, if we're going to talk properly about what it means to partner with uh, China uh, on things like climate, but also hold China accountable uh, on human rights violations, uh, in particular uh, the treatment of the, the Uyghur community, uh, that we've got to be able to, as Western democracies uh, be very transparent about uh, the, the challenges of rights uh, that exist in the US, in France, in Germany, uh, on and on, uh, and um, uh, what we intend to do to uh, close uh, the equity gap uh, in racial justice, in economic inclusion, uh, in creating more broadly shared uh, transparency and access to things like healthcare which at the end of the day, all have a direct relationship uh, to the racial equity question and uh, corresponds uh, with who leads us uh, and how we create um, uh, avenues for different voices uh, to uh, take up our policy work. And do you believe it is these Western nations that need to be the leader, uh, especially when you talk about sort of um, cracking down on China? Um, you worked in South Africa. A lot of there's a lot of countries that still do rely on um, China for a, a lot of their well-being. And so how is it that you contend with some of the human rights issues that you bring mm -hmm. up um, that people are concerned with if, if a country relies on, on a place like China? When I was in South Africa and in other parts of, uh, uh, of, of the continent that I've uh, traveled throughout and I've engaged both with uh, formal leadership and with activist uh, leadership, uh, I found um, uh, communities, constituencies asking really tough questions about the relationship with China and whether or not they were moving into a new era of a, their kind of a kind of post-colonial, neo-colonial uh, uh, dependence. Uh, uh, so I found really tough questions being asked then. And I found really appropriate pushback uh, on me and other uh, diplomats uh, on our own practices, uh, on rights, on lending, on uh, debt relief, et cetera, in uh, the region. I found that to be appropriate, uh, powerful, uh, future forward, uh, and I think uh, it helped me to better interrogate uh, our own uh, practice of partnership uh, and inclusion. And you believe that is something that should be enforced and, and focused on right now? Uh, absolutely. And when you ask me whether or not the Western nations should lead, I think that we all should be leading uh, in uh, partnership. I'm impressed with the stronger institutions that we have 
uh, ar uh, around issues of uh, democratic practice in uh, Latin America, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in Asia. Uh, and we should recognize uh, the strength of those institutions and part partner effectively with them, learn uh, from them, uh, lean into uh, their own uh, histories and their aspirations uh, as well. And a lot of what we've seen over the past few years, a lot of the what you call um, external agitation we've seen uh, on a lot of these issues that we're talking about have come from activists, right? That the role that activists have played have really uh, has really changed over the past decade. Uh, can you speak to that and sort of how you think that is playing into some of the changes that we are seeing? I, th I think that it's underexpressed uh, in our leadership. I, I am I am proud of the fact that I came to my own politics and, and eventually to my own leadership uh, through the anti-apartheid movement. When I was uh, a teenager, uh, I was out in demonstrations. I participated in civil disobedience. I, I joined others who went down to shut down the halls of Congress. And when I was 19 years old, Jennifer, I saw the U.S. Congress overturn the veto pen of the U.S. president on uh, uh, sanctions against the South African regime, and that helped me to appreciate the strength of my voice uh, and how average citizens can do extraordinary things. That informed my uh, activity. When I saw Andrew Young be selected as U.S. ambassador to the United Nations when I was 10 years old, that inspired me with the sense that our civil rights practice at home can inform our human rights practice on issues like the rights of Palestinians or uh, what needed to occur at that time in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, during the Cold War period. So uh, all of that was galvanizing for my generation. And I believe that we saw a global seismic shift uh, as a result of the George Floyd moment, the demonstrations in the US that found solidarity uh, in London, in Paris, in Pretoria, in uh, Accra, uh, and that uh, those those uh, cords of connection and deep solidarity exist today for us to pull on at the diplomatic level uh, that I think will change the world uh, in ways that are lasting and resilient. Do you believe that leaders are taking notice then and, and listening to, to what it is that people are saying? Um, you know, institutions are slow to act, bureaucracies are, are incredibly uh, slow to move. Uh, I know that the changes that have been made in the State Department that's come out of a very, you know, long journey of agitation. Uh, so uh, there, there is some movement, uh, and we should acknowledge that and commend it uh, when it occurs. Uh, but uh, we should always appreciate that we have to impose our will uh, on the arc of justice uh, and uh, on our bureaucracies. Yeah, and especially coming at a time, I mean, as we mentioned, during the pandemic, right, where there's still so many inequalities that we're seeing across the world. Yeah. That's right. And, you know, we, we were introduced into this panel uh, by uh, one of uh, our um, sponsors who talked about uh, the work that they've done on vaccines. We have tremendous vaccine uh, inequity uh, around the world. I'm, I'm sitting uh, in a country that is promoting uh, booster shots uh, when, you know, 4% uh, of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, has, has, has received full uh, vaccination. Uh, so there are some real uh, challenges. Uh, full equity uh, and inclusion around all of these issues uh, uh, and recovering from uh, this pandemic moment means that we have to ask ourselves much, much harder questions about what it means to truly lead, be in solidarity uh, and in partnership at a global level. These are transnational challenges uh, that obligate us to uh, look uh, beyond our own uh, hyper sovereignty. And what would you say, what would you see as a sign of progress, Ambassador Gaspard, um, especially when you think about, I mean, this is such a critical point uh, for so many of these issues that we've talked about for climate I'm, as well. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an organizer and I, I always like to say, uh, in God we uh, uh, trust, but everybody else must bring data. Uh, so I, I cited some numbers in the U.S. State Department where in 2008, uh, 9% of the senior foreign service uh, was black, uh, and now it's 3%. Uh, so if we're talking about progress, we have to have like real metrics. We can't just have appointments being made. We can't just have uh, rhetoric, but we have to move the needle in very real ways uh, that can be uh, transparent uh, and uh, accountable. Uh, and I believe that budgets are a, a real accurate representation of our priorities. Uh, so let's see the budgets. So when we say we're going to center human rights uh, in our foreign policy, uh, let's see how um, uh, what the relationship is between that uh, and the resources that are invested 
uh, in uh, the rights uh, framework uh, and, and, uh, and, and those agencies. It's definitely a journey. It is not one appointment that changes it all. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Ambassador Patrick Caspard, thank you so much for this discussion. I really uh, enjoyed hearing from you, and I know our audience did as well. Uh, it was great yeah. to have you start off this session. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you to Meridian and to the extraordinary panelists that we're about to hear from. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now I, I'm pleased to move on to our next section of the hour uh, and, and welcome three incredible, continue this conversation that we just started off uh, with Ambassador Gaspard. So without further ado, I'm gonna bring everyone in. Uh, let's first bring in Mr. Dipanjan Chatterjee. He is he works as the Vice President and Principal Analyst at Forrester Research. Also, Ms. Sandra Sanda Ojiambo. She is the Executive Director and CEO at the UN Global Compact. And also, Ms. Celia Ouellette, who is the Founder and CEO of the Responsible Business Initiative for Justice. Thank you all so much for being here and for continuing this conversation that we just started with Ms. Uh, Ambassador Gaspard. Thank, Thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer. Thank you for having us. Perfect. So I, I, I kind of want to start uh, where I left it off with Ambassador Gaspard. Um, Dupan John, maybe we start with you. What, what sure. do you see as a sign of, of progress right now? There's a lot of crises that are happening currently. Um, there's a lot of statements and commitments that are happening right now. But what do you signals um, that the private and the public sector are really sort of meeting this moment and, and moving us forward? Look, I think from the private sector, um, you know, we are leaps and bounds ahead of where we were, right? Um, the ambassador referred to uh, the, you know, what happened in the wake of George Floyd's murder, right? And there's a clear sort of a two-year perspective, uh, both coming from the resurgence of the, you know, the movement for racial justice, but there's also a 20 year movement, if you will, in the, in the private world, right? And so let me give you a wide angle lens, which is perhaps a little less intuitive. <laughs> Think about the biggest companies of the world 20 years back, right, the year 2000. I mean, we are talking about Exxon Mobil, we are talking about Citibank, right? The nature of the relationship that consumers had with these brands was very hands-off, it was very transactional, right? You would you know, pull over to a gas station or a petrol pump and you would take some gas. You'd go to the bank, you'd go to the cashier and get some money, right? That's it. Now, fast forward 20 years, think about the biggest brands of today, right? Apple, Google, they are inextricable from our lives, okay? My favorite example, um, in so many dining tables around this country, in addition to the regular family member, there's a new family member who sort of lives in a box, right? It's a genie. Sometimes we call her Alexa. Sometimes you call her Siri. I sometimes wonder what our five and six-year-olds think um, mm -hmm. as to this sort of subhuman entity that joins us for dinner, right? The point of it is think about how close to us in our lives we have allowed brands to come, right? When you allow brands, companies, corporations into your family, into your lives, the expectations you have of them are reset dramatically, right? It's not the same relationship we had with ExxonMobil. So then we start making demands as to not only what the brand should do, but who they are, right? And in particular, we expect them to align to certain values that we have. Right, And I think all the companies have sensed this over the last 5, 10, 15 years. And you've seen a dramatic shift in these corporations pivoting away from being purely a provider of goods and services to being a more sort of complex, multi-dimensional entity that wants to be on the side of the consumer and hence takes positions, has values, take social stand. So I think we really have seen a sea of change in the last decade or so. Celia, I saw you nodding there and I wanted to, to bring you in as well, especially because you are someone who is working with these corporations all the time. Are you, do you agree with what Deepanjan has just said? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that I was nodding was about was, you know, a, a, a thought that um, was was sort of resonant with me was that, you know, I think success, you know, you were asking Ambassador Gaspard what, what success looks like and how, how we, you know, how we measure progress. And I think success with businesses often looks like social success, social justice success is how they're measuring success too. So, you know, for example, we're working with with a business uh, in Ohio whose social justice goals are bail reform in the state of Ohio. That is not a, a, a business metric. That is an external social justice metric that they are setting for themselves. Will they be 100% responsible for uh, poor people going to jail in the state of Ohio? No, uh, they're going to be a, a slice of a much bigger pie, uh, but they do recognize that if the, if the target is the same as those activists and campaigners and organizers on the ground, um, that they're kind of setting their sights on the right spot, and then they organize everything that they can do as a business around achieving that particular uh, goal, but they share the same goal uh, with, uh, with the social justice reformers and campaigners, and like I think that's where we start to measure progress where organizations like mine, which is a campaign organization, as you know, um, are being increasingly invited into businesses to actually set out the milestones for those businesses, which is very easy for us to do because they're our milestones too, right? And so from the very long list of milestones that is our organization's milestones, a company is picking off the ones that are most relevant to them and most impactful to them, but they're not diluting them or translating them into sort of corporate goals. They're lifting social goals and embedding them directly into their internal policies and practices. And Sandra, you're also someone who uh, has been invited into um, the space with, with corporations in terms of the UN's role, right? Can you talk about what it is that you have witnessed, uh, especially when you think about sort of, uh, as Dipanjan was alluding to, our relationships with corporations and, and how, you know, people, people want to know that they're supporting a company that um, supports their values? Yeah, thanks. And I just really want to echo what Dipanjan and, and Celia have said. I mean, the role of business and the expectation from consumers of businesses is certainly heightened in, in this point in time. You know, there's a really important thing, and Dipanjan talked about this, you know, the genie at the table, but also want to say trust, because you don't invite anybody to sit at your dining table. You invite the trusted people. And, you know, trust in business is on the rise. But the truth is, with trust, then comes responsibility. And uh, I just want to quote from a, a survey that was done by Edelman, the Edelman Trust Barometer, and they said that actually, you know, uh, as I said, trust in business has risen, it's highest as opposed to other entities at this point in time. But at the same time, 53% of consumers said that every brand has a responsibility to get involved in at least one social issue that does not directly impact its business. So the expectation from consumers is that business should do more. It's no longer simply that transactional um, you know, relationship that, that consumers have uh, of, of, of businesses. And also increasing, I think it was about 54 or 55% of employees expected that their CEOs should take a stand and speak publicly on societal issues. So the game is changing in terms of the expectation of what business is and trust continues to increase. So I think it's very important to, to really look at then, you know, what this role of business is, how they continue to position themselves and what business ambition is. I, you know, the Global Compact, we really work around balancing the notions of purpose and profit because they truly can coexist. One doesn't have to exist at, at the sacrifice of the other. And I think increasingly that's what we're seeing. And businesses that are successful, businesses that are able to firmly root themselves in the hearts and minds of consumers are those that are able to balance those two notions together. I, I love that purpose and profit. Dipanjan, can you speak to that as well? Um, because yes. ultimately it is it is a business, right? Because so they are thinking about their profits, but but how do you how do they get it right? And how are they genuine, right? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think um, framing this as a zero-sum game between profit and purpose is a fallacy, right? And I think we've come to that realization. So look, the officers of a company have a fiduciary responsibility to maximize shareholder value, right? But let's understand what that value is, because in some cases that equates to 
tangible profit in dollar signs, but you will have plenty of shareholders who value other things, right? So for example, there are institutional shareholders who are agitating to ensure that some of these big banks have racial equity audits inside the companies, right? So shareholders might value things other than profit. Companies also realize that they have other stakeholders, right? So think about the great resignation, right? Uh, employees are leaving in droves. Companies, corporations need to acquire and retain the best talent, right? What they've realized, and you see this in employee walkouts throughout the country, that employees whose identities, by the way, are completely bound up in the place that they work. They believe that the place they work, the, the, the way they invest eight, 10, 12 hours of the day, that entity must share the fundamental values that they bring to work every day. And if it doesn't, if the corporation works in opposition to that, they will literally walk out, right? Um, if you don't have the right employees, if you don't have the best and brightest, you will never be a successful band. You will never generate profit, right? So it is not a zero sum game. These things ought to work together. And I think companies have come to that realization, just like Sandra was saying. Are there some issues that take precedence? Um, Celia, maybe you can jump in here. I mean, I just think of one, uh, we saw a lot of Texas corporations, right? Taking a stand uh, against, um, you know, people, uh, not mandating vaccines, right? Because it was going against their own policies. Mm -hmm. um, Celia, as someone who is working with corporations, again, on, on a lot of these issues, what do you see as, as sort of how they're prioritizing what they choose to take a stance on and act on and what they don't? Definitely, I think that corporations feel the need um, and the need to understand and authentically incredibly engage on issues of race and race equity. Um, you know, we, as you know, we work on um, issues in the criminal justice space, um, and um, I don't think I need to uh, spend much time explaining why issues in the criminal justice space um, are critical to uh, creating meaningful opportunities uh, for communities of color and people that are experienced poverty uh, uh, and some of the most disadvantaged in the community in terms of experiencing mental illness and addiction. These are, uh, these are um, demographic groups that are unbelievably badly uh, represent, over-represented in the justice system in America. Um, you know, when we think about how many people have experienced the justice system, it's 70 million people have a criminal record um, in, in, in the US. Um, and uh, uh, you are nine times more likely to be in that group of people if you are a black man. So I think businesses are increasingly understanding that they need to not just scratch the surface on uh, racial equity within their own companies, um, but also racial equity in a community sense. And I think that is one of the reasons why we are working with so many businesses on issues in the justice space, because businesses do understand that their own policies and practices around um, uh, how they treat people that have experienced the justice system, for example, intentionally hiring people that have a criminal conviction, and their outside strategies on how they are advocating for people um, that have experienced the justice system, for example, on taking um, an advocacy uh, position on um, issues like clean slate or professional licensing reform, bail reform, you know, I mentioned earlier, parole probation reform, sentencing reform, ending juvenile life without parole, incarceration, ending the death penalty. Um, you know, as you know, because you've covered it, you know, we recently uh, launched a campaign with now over 200 business leaders speaking up about the death penalty. And I think many of those business leaders um, see the symbolic uh, connection to the death penalty from a uh, from a from a history of racism in, in the United States. And that is actually a very significant motivating factor in speaking out about an issue that probably historically, traditionally would not have been something that would have been um, a, 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 like a, 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 a no brainer fit for companies. But I do think companies are looking for concrete steps that they can take that will um, uh, advance racial equity, both within their companies and externally. And Sanda, what about globally too? When we think about multinational companies and we think about, I mean, Celia was just talking about some of the issues here in the States. What about, you know, companies who are all uh, over the world 
um, and who have to balance a lot of the issues that are happening in, in different markets. I mean, what, what are the conversations that you as someone from the UN are having with them? Yeah, and it's, it's an important perspective. I mean, what I'd want to say is that companies can no longer, um, if you have that global footprint, you can no longer hide behind it or hide at a corporate HQ. I think we have a much more enlightened, a much more educated citizenry and, and base of consumers in this digital era, you know, news and, and you know, uh, news and, and information spreads very fast. I think for me, one of the most important concepts here in, in dealing with these social issues is it does call for a very significantly different type of leadership. It's a very bold leadership. It's a leadership that is ready to have the conversations you said earlier about purpose and profit about taking on social issues as a senior demonstrator that may not necessarily directly relate to your, uh, your bottom line. But the fact of the matter is that business cannot succeed when society around it is failing in the long term. It certainly cannot. Um, it's also really important to just highlight that you know, silence or inaction is actually a position in and of itself. And I think, again, you know, for business leaders, it does call for taking a stand. Consumers want business leaders to take a stand. Citizens want business leaders to take a stand. So it's, it's really important. And, and one of the things that we say to businesses is that, you know, no matter where you are as a multinational or even as a large national company, you do need to pay attention to what's going on in your supply chain and in your value chain, because it ultimately will affect your brand at the end of the day. So enough to have a great, for example, diversity and inclusion or, you know, human rights policy at HQ, where it's downstream, you have kids who are engaged in child labor or, you know, really skewed uh, diversity and inclusion statistics. So, you know, it's really about taking a whole look at the company, a whole look at the brand. The world is shrinking as a global village and um, consumers and, and, and stakeholders and shareholders broadly are looking at business. Do you believe that corporations are meeting the moment, especially when you think about the, what we're hearing from activists and from people all over the world, Sanda? I think some of them are. We're, we're, we're in a moment. Um, I think the, the, the challenge is, is to move this, to keep the moment and keep the momentum going. Certainly, if I look here in the U.S., there's been, you know, obviously significant uh, events that have created a heightened sense of awareness, a heightened sense of, of a call to action, and certainly the building of alliances that make it really critical for businesses to, to take action. But it's, it's not the same globally, and it's not the same with all businesses. So I do think there's a lot of opportunity First, for continued alliance building, a uh, second for continuous awareness, and third, actually for a lot of leadership introspection and business introspection as well. You know, I, my hope would be that we do not have to get to the levels of a of, of um, you know a George Floyd murder or suddenly a large pandemic for businesses to want to understand what their businesses look like from a responsibility perspective. You know, our work here is to make businesses do this introspection and look at this continuous process improvement because it's important because it's important for business and because it's important for society. So, you know, our preference is that it's a proactive approach to taking action and not reacting because of large global issues or emergency situations. And Dipan John, we're sort of still seeing that though, right? We're seeing some corporations reacting. I mean, a lot of that is because of the pandemic, but um, do you want to see more proactive uh, approach? And as uh, Sanda said, a, a really, a, not aggressive, but a different type of leadership really sort of take us forward. Yeah. Uh, so I think if you're measuring progress, um, you know, do you want to look at your glass half empty or half full, right? Um, we've had sort of significant uh, movement uh, that we haven't had before uh, in, in what we've seen in the last couple of years. So there's been tremendous progress, mm -hmm. but at the same time, um, and I saw this uh, data somewhere, of the $50 billion that have been committed by companies to support Black Rights Matter and racial equity uh, programs, in about two years, only half of 1% has actually been put to any use, right? Um, so I think we are going through sort of a, a, a maturity progression in how businesses tackle these. I think what you saw immediately after George Floyd was people sort of rushed out to communicate, right? Um, you know, they, they posted blogs, they made videos on YouTube, they ran national ads. They, you know, they got it off their chest, but not everyone has been equally quick enough to make good on those pledges, right? Um, so the glass is half full. In, in that we've 
had people make statements that they would never have had made before. But it's half empty in that there is still quite a bit of that journey to traverse. Um, I am hopeful. Look, I think let's, you know, let's, let's be honest. For every company that I can show to you that has taken a stand on these matters, you can probably find me one that hasn't, right? Um, so, so it's a journey. And I think what, assuming that we all believe that the idea of equity, of justice, of human rights is a social good, and we do want to go on that journey, I think the, the stimuli for these brands is going back to what the ambassador said, activism, right? You need consumers to activate and say, look, this is how I want you, the brand to behave if I am to engage in a relationship with you. You want employees to say, as my employer, I will hold you to these certain standards if I am going to join you know, my labor with your enterprise. So I think the, we are picking up momentum and the greater the degree of activism, I think the quicker we'll get to where we want to go. And we're seeing that. Celia, has that played into, has uh, you know, the work of activists helped momentum in, in what you're doing? Yeah, certainly. And I mean, I, I, I think what's really interesting about businesses and activists, right? I, sometimes I think businesses have an allergic reaction even at the word activist. Um, and certainly would never want to describe themselves as CEO activists or, or activists. But um, I think the places where we're seeing businesses be the most successful, uh, both from um, an impact on the ground perspective and from uh, their own brand and reputational perspective in that they're insulated from accusations of uh, hypocrisy or social washing is when businesses partner with the activists, right? You know, this is when um, you're pretty safe because you are doing something that you're being asked to do. You're delivering the message uh, that you're being asked to deliver at the, to the audience at the time that the activists think is the most important. What's quite hard about that is the activist community, the advocacy community is enormous. And to expect even on one topic like criminal justice reform in one country, which is basically what I work on. Um, and so it's completely unrealistic that a business would dedicate the capacity um, to surveying that entire field, um, to building all of the relationships with all of the campaign organizations working on the ground, then make decisions about whether um, a particular issue it resonates as being relevant to them and, and what their impact can be. And I think what we will increasingly see over the coming years is the growth of organizations like ours that sit at that intersection between community organizations and campaigners and businesses with a view to slimming down the menu of things that you are asking businesses to do um, to be stuff that is only uh, 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 realistic, right? And is, and is sort of like a streamlined version. If I was to be asked, what is the single, uh, you know, what is the secret source behind an organization like ours? It is that we make things easy. Truly, it's because we make things easy. We don't tell a business that they need to digest the universe. We digest the universe, and then we uh, and then we ask the business to do that. And I hope, you know, when we talk about things like corporate philanthropy or, 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 or business engagement, if there is not an organization like ours that exists for any topic in any place uh, globally, then businesses should be using their philanthropy to stand that up right if it's migrant policy or if it's working uh, on vaccine equity in sub-saharan africa like if there is if there are too many campaign organizations working on the ground for a business to meaningfully get their head about around it i would actually say rather than spending your own internal uh, capacity figuring that out stand up an external uh, organization that can then do it for you and 50 other companies, right? And will engage. At this point in time, we're working with about 350 companies. It would be unrealistic for one business to field that kind of resources to 349 of its peer organizations. Um, so um, I do think that there is progress. You're you are asking, is there progress? I do think there is progress. And I think the businesses that are uh, being the smartest and most efficient with their voice and their internal capacity, their social capital and their leverage are the ones that have forged really tight partnerships with community organizations and are actually to a very large degree allowing those community organizations um, to set the goals and steer and steer the ship. 
Sandra, can you comment on that? I mean, has that been key uh, to you, uh, to your work as well with businesses partnering with people who activists like Celia and others who are, uh, you know, they know the community? Yeah, I mean, I firmly agree. I think the magnitude of the issues at hand are such that no one entity, no one sector, no one business can really solve them together. And I think, you know, what's really important in, in this moment in time is that especially, you know, um, you know, a lot of, oftentimes people look to governments to solve issues, but increasingly, private sector innovation, uh, civil society innovation coming together, indeed with government can, can work and has truly, especially if you look at it during the pandemic, has resulted in some extraordinary movement. However, as I say, and as I think we've all said here, the glass is half full yet half empty. There's so much more that can be done. I think what I just really do want to highlight is that partnership is really the way to, to move forward in addressing a lot of the social issues that we face at hand. And I really want to, uh, before we get to audience questions, I want to ask all of you, um, when we think about all of the issues that this world is, is currently tackling, what is it that corporations maybe are not paying enough attention to that they, that they need to be? Is there something that maybe is not on the news every day or on social media um, that you believe is, is the next thing that corporations need to pay attention to? Look, I would I urge corporations to be self-serving to the extent that they need to remain relevant to the consumers of tomorrow, right? Um, if you look five, 10, 15 years down the road, if you can look around the corner, you will realize that the consumer is changing, right? Irreversibly. Um, you know, look at this country, look at the, the racial ethnic composition of this country and how dramatically that's changed since I came to college here 30 years ago, right? Um, think about how consumers believe brands should behave on social issues. I ran some segmentation analysis. And what you see, for example, if you look at it by generations, one out of 10 baby boomers believe that companies should take a stand in social position. That becomes one out of six for Gen Xs, one out of four for Gen Zs and millennials, right? Now the population curve always moves to the right. So the one out of 10s are gonna age out. The one out of sixes are gonna age out. And what's going to come after Gen Z, and I don't even know what they're called, I think Gen Alpha, right? Um, all signs indicate that they will be even more demanding of social action. So move the entire population curve to the right. And if you're a brand and you're looking 20 years down the road to cater to your customers of 2040, that's what your customers want, right? So I think only the truly visionary brands have that periscope to see what's coming around the corner. The rest of them really need to look at it. So I say, look, if you think of nothing else, right? Be self-serving in order to stand up a solid, robust brand that can drive profit, that can drive market share. Those are the people that you have to cater to. Hmm. Celia, I'd love for you to jump in. Yeah, I think I'm going to actually just copy a lot of it <laughs> and say that um, do be self-serving and in doing so, look at both external and internal factors. So maybe if the thing that I would say is missing is I sometimes talk to businesses who will say, we'll work on internal stuff, but we won't advocate on policy reform or we're going to use our CEO advocacy, but it's tough for us to do things internally. And I think actually your exposure to be called out um, uh, it, it goes up if you divorce the two. You need to be thinking about systemic change external to your company, as well as system change in terms of your internal policies and practices, and how that self-serving is really well played out um, in the work in the workforce crisis, right? You know, I flew through Atlanta airport recently and could not get food at any restaurant because there was only one restaurant open because of workforce uh, shortages. And the line was, you know, more than an hour long to order food at that, at that one food outlet. And so companies are increasingly looking to the formerly incarcerated workforce in order to, um, fill positions that they're struggling to fill right now that's fantastic that's an internal policy and practice but they should also be advocating for those systemic barriers that prevent the formerly incarcerated population from getting back to work clean slate it's the process whereby a, a criminal record is automatically expunged using a tech solution rather than asking people to pay money and fill out forms and in terms of kind of numbers 
30, uh, 30 million people's records have been expunged in the state of Pennsylvania. Utah is about to turn on this tech solution um, in the state. 200,000 people's records will be immediately expunged. And businesses in both those states have been at the heart of advocating for those systemic changes. And 200,000 people returning to the workforce in a state like Utah is not antithetical to the benefit, um, you know, to the, to the bottom line of businesses. Sanda, I'd love for you to come in as well. Um, I agree. Business, you know, take a self-serving look, take a forward-looking look at, at, at what your customers and your consumers are going to be like. I'd also say, just take a look at your footprint. You know, you're only going to be as strong as your weakest link. And if that weak link is your supply chain, if it's something that happens downstream, if it's your carbon footprint, if it's, you know, what your diversity and inclusion looks like in one of your subsidiaries, then that's going to be it. So, you know, forward-looking, inward-looking, but you've also got to look outward because that's probably where your weakest link may be. Right. And I want to get to some yes. of the questions that we're getting, we're getting. getting. Um, but before we run out of time. Um, I want to start here with this one, which is a really great one. What about holding organizations accountable, both internally and externally? And I guess um, that goes to the question, what's at stake if, if these companies don't, right? Um, I don't know who wants to start, but I'd love, yeah, Celia. I'm super happy to start on that because we've seen some really high profile examples of that in the justice space. You know, a good example would be uh, Barclays Bank, a big high street bank in the United Kingdom um, had joined a pledge to not fund private prison corporations and uh, was outed as underwriting uh, the, the, the construction of private prisons in the state of Alabama, uh, the decision to expand prisons in the state of Alabama came as the response uh, to uh, uh, horrible prison conditions in the state. And rather than reduce prison populations, the state decided to increase the number of beds uh, and, and financially incentivize a company uh, to fill those beds. Uh, and the, the reputational, the call out um, uh, uh, caused Barclays considerable reputational damage, and they pulled out of the agreement to underwrite uh, that particular deal. So, I, you know, the fallout is pretty catastrophic for companies um, uh, when they uh, when they uh, don't practice what they preach. Hmm. Dipan John, have you have you seen that similarly? Look, I think they're the companies are penalized by their stakeholders. Yeah. Right? I have seen so many instances of investors who are actively looking to put their money into firms that meet certain ESG criteria or conversely pull their money out, right? They are penalized, obviously, as we've been talking about by their customers who say, hey, I will not transact business with you if you don't live up to my expectations of you, right? Um, Celia just spoke about Atlanta and the labor shortage. There are employees saying, look, I will not go to work for you, right? Mm -hmm if you're not the kind of brand that uh, I want you to be, right? So the, the penalties are coming at them from all directions, from all their stakeholders, um, which is why, you know, we kind of, we talked about the idea of, look, in, at the end of the day, you are being self-serving because you are being hurt, um, you know, if you don't do certain things and you're being hurt by all your stakeholders. And just to go to this next question, because I think it's relevant to what we were just saying. I mean, in terms of, you know, penal or the perp the power that uh, consumers have. We're currently going through a supply chain crunch, right? Um, and so, how can consumers actually use their purchasing power then to, you know, speak out and act uh, out on businesses that are not supporting them? I'd give that to, to the floor. It's tough, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in here. I, I think they, they are. They are already doing it. And, um, you know, I think there's, there's, there's two angles to the one. I think consumers also saying, well, look, let's now turn in and, and support smaller businesses. Let's, let's rebuild businesses that, that haven't perhaps made it through the pandemic. Let's rebuild, you know, the mom and pop shop around the corner or this great entrepreneur that does uses organic materials to produce a product. So one, I think consumers are actually having this awareness around rebuilding uh, you know, smaller businesses rebuilding economies at a local level, but second, also holding large corporations to account. I, I think it's happening uh, by and large at, at the two fronts, and it is very important for, for businesses to, to really reflect on that. It could be an opportunity to, to support smaller businesses, essentially. Absolutely. I think also it's causing businesses to publish 
their, uh, you know, consumer calls are call, calling businesses to publish um, their data, their metrics and their goals. And then people are keeping the receipts on this too, um, which means that even if it's a, a sort of more passive way rather than boycotting a company, it does mean that if a company has published its goals and 12 months later, it's not meeting its goals and has committed to publish where it is with them um, through the 12 months, those companies are going to try and meet those goals that they have set for themselves because they know um, that the time is going to come when they're going to have to show receipts uh, for what they've done. Tipanjan, did you want to comment as well? You know, I think uh, the decision to consume is a fairly complex one, right? There are many attributes to it. You price, quality, convenience, access, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And kind of the social values is one component of that, right? So we have to be realistic about it. And it, it doesn't apply equally in every instance. So I think if you're in an environment with a supply crunch, um, limited access, prices are artificially high, consumers may make certain decisions that really does not reflect their steady state of behavior, right? So I would caution companies to be, um, to sort of not be complacent uh, and to not think that the way individuals are making decisions around their consumptions today will necessarily reflect how they want to consume once everything returns to a state of equilibrium, right? So this very well could be an aberration and an aberration which we expect to go away. So don't extrapolate from faulty data. How do you continue that momentum then? The, the momentum to get brands- uh, to, to, keep, to keep people on board, to, to not make this just about being a moment and really um, sort of the way of, of the future, progress, progressing into the future. I think from a, a, there are social structural shifts that will ensure that the momentum will continue. I mean, going back to the idea, we, we talked about the, the racial and ethnic composition of this country, right? Um, that provokes a certain kind of behavior and receptivity to the messages that brands put out, right? Let me, let me give you another example. If you think about gender and the evolution of perception of gender, in 35 countries around the world, about half the people do not agree that a binary system of male and female necessarily summarizes how we look at gender, right? That's a fundamental shit. I mean, think about an idea that is so sacrosanct, right? We are so wedded into this concept of male and female. If half the people in most of the world are saying, I don't really know about that, right? I I'm not convinced. The momentum is already there. I mean, this is a structural underlying change in the way we think, right? The blips of supply chain outages is not going to do anything to change the momentum of such a seismic change. And I'd, I'd love to get this last question in uh, to all of you before we have to close out the hour. Uh, I think this is really nicely tying everything together. How can activists and businesses, when we talk about all of the issues that exist, right now, how can activists and businesses work together to achieve uh, what some people would say are, are some common goals, not everything, right? What, what is it that needs to happen if there's there's one piece of advice that, that all of you would give? Celia, do you wanna start? Yeah, I mean, businesses just need need to commit something, right? Whether it's public affairs, whether it's the, the, the time of their CEO, whether it's government affairs and their lobbying capacity, whether it's their HR and operations teams, um, you know, uh, we were just saying, like, how do we keep businesses in this space? And we've talked a lot today about partnership. And the truth is, it's on us as much as it is on businesses, right? It is unrealistic of the activist community to expect businesses will, will, will hold this torch. And I'll close by saying um, that last night, uh, as I met with a business, um, you know, he said to me as I was leaving, which is a really good point, don't forget us either right as we go as rbij goes about whizzing around the place as you know in millions of states at any given time like don't let us forget that we should and uh, must keep asking businesses we'd be involved in this can you help us with that we're doing this next so i think that that conversation is two-way 
Um, it's a sort of social contract that sits on the table that we both sign, where activist community says, we will keep coming to you and asking you things. And the business community will say, we will keep saying yes uh, to at least some portion of it. That's Sandra. I would just say, and I fully agree, it, you know, the moment for partnership is, is here and it's now. What's probably most important for us to speak from the perspective of where I sit is really understanding what the, you know, what it is that we're trying to change, what the problem at heart is, and then bringing out what are the principles that we need to bring to the table. So for me, it's for business, really reflecting on that purpose and bringing out business purpose, underlying principles that make all these issues very important because human rights is important to business, diversity and inclusion is important to business, you know, child labor issues are important to business. They may not necessarily always have a dollar figure, but they are very important to business. And the principles that underpin them I think is where that meeting point for civil society work and, and business to come together will be. Jipan Jan, can have you closed? Sure, I would say as a company, take what you do best. Take mm. your core competence and springboard off that, right? So for example, if you're Kohler, no one knows water and toilets like you do, right? Kohler is working around the world uh, with a variety of agencies to bring clean water, to bring toilets in rural areas. If you're Microsoft, no one knows technology like you do. Microsoft's been working in Massachusetts, building virtual reality solutions in the criminal justice process to help inmates transition out. They're working in Texas to build data dashboards, right? Um, you know, it's great to write a check. I'm sure plenty of people are delighted that companies do. But if you can actually take what you do best and bring it to bear, I think that's where you have the most impact. Absolutely. I think that's a really great way to close. Uh, this was such a fascinating conversation. And as all of you um, really alluded to, it is a two-way street. It is not um, anyone against one another. We're all living on this planet. And so uh, it needs to be a cooperation between everyone. So, uh, you know, I really want to say on behalf of Meridian, thanks to everybody who tuned into this, especially to Dipanjan Chatterjee, Sanda Ojiambo, and also Celia Woulet for that fascinating conversation. And of course, Ambassador Patrick Gaspard earlier. This has been really wonderful and I really feel fortunate to be a part of this discussion. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Thanks thank everyone. You, Jennifer. Thank, thank you, Jennifer.